Well, that was fun. That was a great way to start the morning. Let me give you the bad news first. I have nothing to offer you for free today. I don't really know how to compete with that, but as I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, Dan, fantastic job. I'm inspired by the 100-year vision. And Parker, the work that you and the team have been doing, it's unbelievable. And then free, I didn't know how to compete. So I thought I would maybe share a reaction that I had to that idea of what you do here in that dream job as I've explained it to my children. Because I was leaving to come here yesterday, and I've got two small boys. And they often ask me about work. And I think as many of us are parents, we try to explain what we do every day to our kids. And we have to pick and choose. And we have to make the story consumable in a way that makes sense to them. And so I said, guys, I'm going to Las Vegas. and I'm going to meet with thousands of people who use our products. And, and what they really do is they help moms and dads come home happy at the end of the day. Just like I come home happy, because what they're doing is finding the right match between an opportunity and a person. And that is what you guys are doing. You guys are adding so much happiness to the world. And I'm just really moved by it, and I just really, really admire it. So hats off to you guys, and thank you for doing what you do. It inspires me. I'm really looking forward to the next half hour, 45 minutes with you, because I'm really excited to share an insight into a person that I have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with and have an opportunity to understand a little bit about how he thinks and what's important to him, but we don't really have much of an opportunity to share that. And so we thought we would try to do that in as intimate way as possible, as one can with a group of several thousand people and several thousand more watching. Because some of us are fortunate enough to know people that we would describe as great human beings. And many of us have worked for a manager who invests in us, who takes time to develop us, and who really cares about us. And some of us have even worked in an organization that's led by a super inspiring CEO. But very, very few of us had have an opportunity to have that person all mashed up into one. And that's who I'm delighted to bring to you today. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Jeff Wiener, the CEO of LinkedIn. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I was thinking about doing a parkour walk-on. Nice. I'm I, didn't think it, it. I didn't think it would fit with we'll, the, the we'll kind words. We'll do it. The trampolines are still there. OK. Should we do it? No. No. Sorry. Not Mike, Mike was a gymnast, so he's not kidding, not, for those that don't know. Not going to do it. There was a, there was a bet earlier. Not going to happen. So, so Jeff, I, I would love to start uh, really talking a little bit about one of the things that I found both most surprising when I joined the company and, and watch uh, as you've developed us and that I'm most passionate about, about now that I think has a lot to do with, with our crowd here today. And Jeff made the first priority of our company talent. We are literally operationalizing as the most important priority in the company talent. And I'd love it if, if you could explain for everybody why you did that, what it means to you, and how do you lead a company really in a practical sense with that as our first priority? Yeah, the, the talent first approach actually started uh, years before I joined LinkedIn. And uh, while uh, I was at Yahoo, I uh, was working on uh, a massive, complex uh, scaling initiative that required hundreds of engineers and product people. And uh, it was very challenging. A lot of people thought it, it couldn't be done. And uh, we were able to, to pull it off. And afterwards, uh, I was reflecting on how we made it possible and realized that, in part, it started with prioritization and focus. But uh, none of it would have happened had it not been for the talent we were able to pull together, some of the world's best engineers. And looking back on it after the project was complete, I realized that we weren't treating, I wasn't treating talent, uh, the recruiting of talent, the development of talent, the retention of talent, as with the same kind of prioritization, the same urgency, the same importance as we had that massive initiative. And historically, talent's really been a support function. I think that's the way a lot of companies think about it. And it was after that initiative where I recognized there's no reason you wouldn't treat it the same way you would the, the single most important project you're working on at any given time at the company. 
And if you think about it, how many companies do that? How many folks in the audience have worked for managers who do that? And I think historically that was a bit unusual. Now the world increasingly recognizes that talent is the ultimate asset. And I think you're starting to see more and more companies making talent their top priority, putting talent first, not thinking about talent as something you do reactively, but something you're constantly investing in proactively. And so I'd love to stay on this topic because I feel like we, under your leadership, live that in a really unique way. Can you bring any examples to life, whether it's uh, how we pursue talent in, from a talent acquisition perspective or recognize talent or create space for talent to, tr to truly be? the top priority? Well, you know, it, it starts with the prioritization. So uh, for those that don't know, talent is the, the number one priority at, at LinkedIn, and we are constantly reinforcing it at every turn. So we do an all hands uh, every other week. We've been doing it uh, since I joined the company almost five years ago today. As a matter of fact, the all hands predated me. And uh, we walk through the operating priorities of the company. And the first is talent, uh, the second is technology, the third is product, and the fourth is monetization. And when we talk about talent, we're trying to reinforce at every turn uh, the importance of recruiting, the importance of onboarding, the importance of ongoing development, uh, retention, all the things that make what we do possible. And it's not enough, obviously, to get up every other week and talk about an all-hands setting. It, it really has to be reinforced at every turn through culture and values, through your leadership. Uh, when people are first joining the company. As a matter of fact, take a step back. Uh, our reinforcement of talent begins in the recruiting process. When we're interviewing candidates, when we're assessing fit, do they understand we're a talent first organization? Do they understand what it means to participate in a talent first organization? To the extent they're going to be leading or managing, to what extent have they experienced that in the past? And so it, it starts in the interview process. The reinforcement of our culture, the reinforcement of talent first actually begins in the interview process. Then once that person uh, decides to join LinkedIn and there's uh, the right alignment, the right fit, we reinforce it again in the onboarding process. And then again, once they're at the company, at every turn through learning and development, and we actually evaluate performance uh, first and foremost based on the extent to which people are walking the walk on our culture and values. So it, it permeates literally everything we do. And I don't know any other way to make it possible. Love it. I do. I mean, as, listen, as an employee, it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. As someone trying to represent all of you, it's just a joy to be in a company where we're trying to live this and create the things that help you live it around the world. I'd like to go uh, to, to Dream Job next. We talked a little bit about it this morning. And uh, I have heard you describe uh, to me and to others that you are in your dream job right now. And if you're comfortable sharing, I'd love for you to share any of the kind of the personal background that led you to the moment of becoming the CEO of LinkedIn and how those interests of yours have overlapped and now manifested in what you're doing in the world today? One of the questions I'm asked most frequently by interns, uh, new college grads, uh, folks that are looking for career path advice and mentorship is how to ultimately realize your dream job. And the advice I always begin with is it all starts with understanding what it is you ultimately want to accomplish. And it sounds like an oversimplification, but you'd be amazed how many people have never taken the time to think about the dream. You know, going forward 20, 30 years at the end of one's career, what do you want to look back and say you accomplished? And one of the reasons people haven't given it thought is they get swept up in this stream of opportunity. Uh, a promotion here, a promotion there, uh, more money, uh, a hotter company, in quotes, a hotter company, grass is always greener. And after doing that 10, 15 years, you may wonder why you're not happy, you don't feel fulfilled, you don't feel inspired, and that you're pursuing your ultimate sense of purpose or what actualizes you. And that's because you haven't taken the time to understand what it is you want to do. And to make that possible, I think it requires optimizing for two dimensions. Uh, one is skill and the other is passion. And it's not one at the exclusion of the other. And for younger folks coming out of school, they may have no idea what they want to do. And that's perfectly natural. Uh, and for those folks, I recommend starting to try different things or put yourself in a position or a situation where you get exposure to the broadest possible number of opportunities. So by trial and error, you can determine things that you don't like and start to narrow in on the things that you do like. But as your career evolves, I think it becomes increasingly important to take the time 
to understand what it is that you ultimately want to do. I, I was very fortunate at a young age. I knew that I wanted to be a part of reforming the educational system in the United States. And that has informed and colored virtually every career decision I've ever made, even where I went to school. Uh, at the time I was thinking about where I wanted to go to school, I had to make a decision. Did I want to pursue a life in the public sector and actually teach or administrate or legislate? Uh, or did I want to pursue a life in the private sector and ideally amass enough influence and resources that I could contribute that way? And I elected to pursue the latter. But education has been a part of everything I've done, whether it's philanthropic endeavors or in my career, the democratization of the flow of information and making sure that people have greater access to information. And with LinkedIn, it's really the, the other part of the equation. And as I got older, I realized it's not just about education. Because if economic opportunities don't exist, the education's not going to be nearly as valuable. It's this yin and yang, to some extent, of having the education so you can seize the opportunities once they exist. And so to be in a position at LinkedIn where you can help people to realize their dreams to help create economic opportunity for others, to help people continue to advance themselves, continue to improve in terms of their ongoing education and continuous improvement, uh, it's a dream job. And, and speaking of economic opportunity, we saw uh, Dan remind us of the vision of the company around the creation of economic opportunity. C can you talk a little bit about why that is at the heart of what we aspire towards and what, what do we think the outcome of that is gonna be? I, I can't imagine anything more profoundly important than the creation of economic opportunity for people. And you know, if you subscribe to hierarchy of needs, uh, you recognize that uh, before you can start to, to realize your full potential, you have to have certain building blocks in place, food, clothing, and shelter, for example. And in creating economic opportunity for people, you not only improve the quality of that individual's life, you improve the quality of the lives of the people around them, their families, for example, or the people that they in turn can create economic opportunity for. One of the things that is so exciting and unique about working at LinkedIn is that our vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce holds not only for every employee of the company, but every member of LinkedIn. Because every member of LinkedIn is in a position to create economic opportunity for others. That's the power of the network. And in developing countries and hard-hit cities around the world, we're actually creating role models, professional role models, entrepreneurial role models for the next generation without these examples wouldn't even know it was possible. And so that creates truly sustainable transformation on a global basis. And it's very inspirational. It's very exciting. And then operationally, how do you manage a company towards that? I mean, where does vision and mission and strategy, how do those work together and tie in? So I think it starts by clearly defining what we mean by vision and mission and strategy, objectives, priorities, culture, values, and then reinforcing it at every turn. A lot of companies have a tendency to use vision and mission synonymously. And they may come up with one statement and at times call it a vision and other times call it a mission. I think there's a, a very clear distinction to be drawn between the two. For me, a vision is the dream. It, it's true north. It's how you inspire your employees day in and day out. It's why they get out of bed in the morning. It's what they want to do what they want to ultimately accomplish, it may or may not be realizable. The mission, on the other hand, is the overarching objective for the organization, which I believe needs to be measurable and realizable and hopefully inspirational. So we talked about the vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. Our mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. And that's highly measurable. When we talk about professionals, we're talking about knowledge workers and by some measures, there's north of 600 million knowledge workers in the world, and we measure our ability to connect every one of them every day. So that's how we draw a distinction between vision and mission. Strategy is the way in which we navigate the competitive landscape, the technical landscape, to achieve our objectives. And uh, this is another uh, area where I think sometimes uh, companies have a tendency to use words loosely, where they use strategy to describe what I would refer to as tactics and priorities. Uh, but I think it's really important to recognize that strategy is a, about much more than what you're doing on any given day. It's about understanding the way in which the world is evolving and how your company is going to participate in that highly dynamic environment. Uh, with regard to objectives, it's how we measure our progress, how we measure our results. If you can't measure it, you can't fix it. And uh, that is why it's so important to define your objectives and to be as clear as possible. 
And then when it comes to culture and values, you know, for us, our culture, the way we define culture, is it's our collective personality as an organization. And it's not only who we are today, it's who we aspire to be. And that last component, this aspirational dimension, I think is critical because I think oftentimes companies lose credibility with their teams by defining a culture that people recognize doesn't exist. And so if you add that aspirational component, people may see that it may not be where you are today, but you're all on the same page in terms of ultimately aspiring to get there. And then lastly, with regard to values, it's the operating principles that we use to make decisions day in and day out. And so once that framework's in place, the clearer you can be about how you define those various dimensions, uh, the better a job you can do at making sure that every member of your team is pulling in the right direction. And you know, David Gergen, uh, for those that don't know, uh, he was the director of communications in six different White House administrations, a master communicator, writes books on the subject. He once said that if you want to get something across, want to get a point across, particularly to a larger audience, you have to repeat yourself so often that you get sick of hearing yourself say it, and only then will people begin to understand what you're talking about. And so it's not just enough to define what you're about, you have to repeat it over and over again until people begin to internalize it. Uh, I was at dinner last night with a handful of our clients, and I asked a number of people what they'd like to ask you. I said, I'll be sitting down with Jeff tomorrow, Here's your opportunity. You can ask him anything you want. There were a couple of off-color things. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but there were a couple of really thoughtful ones. And, I and think we should go with the off-color stuff. OK. No, so, no, 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 no. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. That's there not a good there idea. was something about a demonstration of a special skill or talent. <laughs> so we, we, could, we, could, we could leave them in suspense and come back to that one if we have well, time. Well, you should but. at the very least explain where that comes from. Great. So, so, so uh, at LinkedIn, we have a, a lovely tradition that started really at the very beginning of the company, where in the early days when we were still a very small company, every single new employee was asked to come before the collected uh, employee base at an all hands and introduce themselves. It's a rite of passage. You say your name, what you're doing, sometimes where you've come from, something that is not on your LinkedIn profile that would be about you. And ideally, this is an entertaining part. And then the demonstration of a special skill or a talent, or in the old days we used to do an animal noise. And we have, and so nowadays where we hire more people than we can get in front of everyone in the company, all hands, otherwise it'd make for a very dull all hands, we, we allow a, a handful of people to go up. And so we try to take that piece of our culture out with our clients, and so at dinners like the one I was at last night, we went around the table and we had everyone uh, introduce themselves, demonstrate special skills, and by the way, my dinner party where you guys, you are skilled. That was, you, I mean, you rocked it, which was great. And so that's why someone was asking what, if Jeff were at our dinner last night, what would he have demonstrated? So. <laughs> that's a long way to go for me to not do something right now. So would you like to see Holy him demonstrate smokes. some kind of special skill or talent? Hey. You know, <laughs> this is gonna end up all over the place, <laughs> taken why, out of context. Why, 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 don't, why, don't, why don't we hold it? We'll see if we have time for it. I'll describe it. And, and maybe uh, in a different circumstance, I'll Perfect. demonstrate it. I, I would have done the robot, which I did for my table last night. Oh, nice, nice. So, yeah. so why, don't we, why don't we see this? Why don't, we, why don't we look for Jeff later today? And you guys, have, it's kind of like I'm writing you an IOU voucher for special <laughs> skill or talent that you can cash when Done. you see this guy later. Done. I think some cameras start going up. Yeah, people perfect. thought I was yeah. going to do not it. Gonna not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Later, later, later. Back to our regularly scheduled program. So. One of the real questions that I got, both at dinner last night uh, and as I was circulating right before we started over in this general direction, was we were talking about a skills gap. Hmm. And the particular context was whether it's in healthcare or whether it's in any really specialized skill, a lot of us in this community wrestle with the challenge of finding the precisely correct person for what we need and at scale. This is something that it manifests differently for all of us, but it's actually a very shared problem, and it's a shared problem in the world. I'd love to have any of your thoughts on the skills gap generally and how you see us playing to help that. Yeah, this is a serious issue. So for those that don't know, in the United States alone, there's 3.8 million available jobs, and yet unemployment remains at about 7.5%. Youth-based unemployment is, is twice that rate. And then you've got millions upon millions of people who are underemployed, uh, those are folks that are pursuing full-time jobs that have only been able to find temporary work. So 
uh, we've got a lot of people that are interested in finding jobs, and yet the number of available jobs is at its highest level in years. And one of the reasons for that is because there's a mismatch between the opportunities that are being created and the aggregate skills of our workforce. And if you think about why this is happening, there's a secular trend in place now that is only going to get worse. And that is that the rate of innovation is now exceeding our ability to train people uh, to keep up with those innovations and more specifically the opportunities created from those innovations. And if you look back throughout history, uh, you can get a sense of what I'm referring to. So during the agrarian age, innovation took place across millennium, thousands of years, which gave people plenty of time to retool and to learn how to get the most from their harvests and their fields. And then the Industrial Revolution happened. That took place over roughly two centuries. Again, plenty of time to get educated and figure out what role you're going to play in that world. Uh, the information age unfolded uh, across decades. And today, in this digital economy that we live in, uh, change is taking place in a matter of years, if not months. And uh, as a result of that, we need to just fundamentally change the way in which we're preparing our workforce and the way we regulate and the way we're investing in our infrastructure. And so I think three ways in which uh, we can improve the situation are through education, uh, both uh, really transforming the way in which we go about educating kids and, and primary school uh, reform, as well as uh, vocational training. Uh, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurial activity these days. There's a lot of innovation taking place in terms of higher education. I would love to see some of that same entrepreneurial energy focused on vocational training, just equipping people in real time with the skills they need to realize some of these opportunities that exist, to contribute uh, to the economy when they want to so desperately. Uh, so education is going to be, I think, a critical piece of the equation. Uh, the, the second part is immigration reform. Uh, you know, there are people born outside of this country who are very interested in working within the United States and taking on some of these uh, roles and responsibilities that are going unfilled. And yet, I think people are so focused on making sure that people born inside the country have access to those roles that they're erecting barriers. And the challenge there is that if we don't have people equipped and qualified to take on those jobs, they go unfilled. And the longer those jobs are unfilled, the longer we go without creating more economic opportunities for others without generating salaries that get redistributed into our local economies, without taxes being paid and generated, which gets reinvested in the American economy. And it's also very important to recognize that uh, with regard to Fortune 500 companies, 40% uh, of them uh, were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. And these are the companies that are innovating and breaking through with new technologies, new products, new services that fundamentally shape our economy and create uh, opportunities for other people. And then lastly is digital infrastructure. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone has access uh, to the right information, the right intelligence, the right learning opportunities so they can continue to improve over time, so they can continue to retool, so that we can continue to train the workforce for not the jobs that once were, but the jobs that are going to be. And, uh, you know, I think as a country, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Yeah, and, and as a globe, we, we have a very global membership, as you know. And in, in the audience, I saw on the map where everyone put their stickers. And so we have, we have a very global audience here today. You, you travel quite a bit uh, with LinkedIn around the world. Many of the people in our audience today have jobs with a global remit and have offices where you're thinking about opening a new place, a new part of the world. Can you share any perspectives on what you've gleaned from your travels around the world about what is the talent acquisition landscape, how it's developing around the world? What's the same? What's different? Well, it's, you know, it's obviously going to be very different in, in different countries. And you take uh, more developed economies and some of the, the macroeconomic headwinds, say in Western Europe, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, we've recognized over the last several years is uh, the rate of growth of our membership in countries like Spain, in countries like Italy, in countries like France, that we would have thought were more mature in terms of member penetration. And folks are concerned. People are anxious. People are out of work. You see unemployment there at uh, record levels on a sustainable basis. And so they're turning to their networks. They're looking for ways to 
uh, facilitate their ongoing improvement in training. Uh, you know, you start to see uh, migratory patterns where people are leaving uh, the, their country of origin for other countries where the opportunities exist. And so uh, leveraging a platform like LinkedIn to better recognize where those opportunities are becomes important. What this group does in our audience today is absolutely essential. Dan was talking about uh, the, the transformation that takes place when people have an opportunity to pursue their dream jobs in a hierarchy of needs, that's the tip of the pyramid. You know, you've got countries all over the world where people are out of work. And so anything that we can do to connect that talent with opportunity in any way to help them progress, I, I think is going to be essential. Uh, you look at uh, more developing economies, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, and uh, we're seeing uh, explosive growth in terms of uh, people uh, coming online, uh, looking for jobs. Uh, we're seeing companies within these uh, emerging markets and economies uh, looking to fill roles from outside of their countries, obviously. Uh, so the flow of talent, even within companies, uh, across borders is becoming a, a critical tool uh, for companies to be able to fill uh, these unfilled roles. You also see uh, just widespread societal change in terms of people in, in certain developing economies who decades ago uh, didn't know where their next meal was coming from. And the rate of growth in some of these countries has been nothing short of astounding over the last 20 years. And now these folks are trying to figure out, you know, what kind of car they're going to buy. And they're comparing themselves to their friends. And they need to figure out what their sense of purpose is. And are they going to be properly prepared to take care of their parents in certain societies? And so you have these conflicting tensions and objectives. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how, how some of those questions unfold over time. So you know, it depends on which region of the world you're in. So while we're on global, you've brought a very big vision to LinkedIn around a concept that you call the economic graph, which really ties together a number of the things that we've been talking about. I'd love it if you could share a little bit about what that vision is, why it's important to you, and how we are en route to manifesting it. Sure. So today, LinkedIn has generated the value that it has uh, by virtue of having built uh, a professional graph, uh, essentially mapping the connections between professionals on a global basis up to three degrees. And that's just the beginning. What we ultimately want to do is map the global economy to create the world's first economic graph. So what is the economic graph? It would be a digital representation of every economic opportunity in the world, full-time or temporary. A digital representation of every skill required to obtain one of those opportunities. A profile for every company in the world. A profile for every higher educational organization in the world. A professional profile for every member of the global workforce, three billion plus people. And then the ability to overlay the professionally relevant knowledge and business intelligence and insight and experience of every one of those individuals, companies, and universities to the extent they want to share it. And then what we want to do is get out of the way. And we want to allow capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, and of course human capital, to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, help transform the global economy. That's how we want to manifest our vision. And so, en route to that, what are some of the things that our audience can expect to see from us over the, over the course of the next several years in a practical sense? Yeah, the, the beauty of our vision for the manifestation of the economic graph is that it's not science fiction. It's, it's already happening today. So every one of those building blocks, every one of those dimensions already exists. The realization of the full economic graph will just be the continuation of the scaling of each of those dimensions. Uh, so you think about economic opportunities and the, the growth of jobs that are available on LinkedIn and our continuing investment in making it easier than ever before for your companies to get their jobs on LinkedIn in front of the right member at the right time. Uh, we've got an enormous database, tens of thousands of uh, skills and structured data around those skills and are now collecting billions of endorsements that create a metadata la layer that enable us to identify who has what skill, either self-identified or reinforced through others, and the ability to generate very clear signals in terms of what skills people have, what skills people need to pursue their career paths. We have uh, roughly three million active companies on LinkedIn. Uh, as Dan mentioned earlier with the launch of our university 
pages. We now have over a thousand universities and that's growing by the day. Uh, nearly a quarter of a billion professionals are on LinkedIn. That's on our way to realizing our mission of 600 million knowledge workers and then ultimately north of 3 billion people in the global workforce, all of whom will have a professional profile on LinkedIn. And with regard to knowledge sharing, you know, you see it in terms of the homepage, you see it in terms of status updates, groups, uh, our influencer platform, the acquisition of SlideShare, Pulse, etc. So it's happening. It's just a question of how quickly uh, we can achieve the kind of scale that we ultimately dream about. Uh, you mentioned the influencer platform, which we pointed to before, and which is one of uh, my personal favorite things that we've worked on as a company over the last couple of years. You're an influencer. You've become an author now over the last year or so. And you've written a number of pieces that have uh, really gotten traction. Would you mind talking a little bit about your experience as an influencer and maybe for those who haven't read your piece on talent and how you think about identifying talent. Hmm. Share a little bit of thoughts around that. Sure, uh, you know, the, the influencer platform, we actually talked about last year, I think I was right here on the stage talking about the launch and how excited we were. And it's gone on to exceed uh, our, our wildest expectations. No one uh, within the company could have predicted uh, where influencers uh, would have taken the company in terms of uh, bringing to life our aspiration to be the definitive professional publishing platform and an essential source of professional insights. Participating in the program gives me a sense of, of the power of influencers. And, you know, when I first posted and it was read, you know, 10,000 times, 20,000 times, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then one day uh, did a post about uh, my career path and the, the best advice I ever got. And it just resonated, I guess, with the audience. And I think it's been read uh, over you know, 750,000 times. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. This is, <laughs> this is pretty serious stuff. And you, know, you start showing up places, and people I've never met before are coming up and saying, thank you so much for writing that particular post, this post. It kind of changed the way I'm thinking about doing things. And that was ultimately what we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to facilitate the sharing of people's experience and their insight. And so it's incredibly gratifying. Uh, with regard to one particular post that Mike's referring to that may be particularly germane to this audience, I wrote about the, the five tool superstar. And it was about the, the skills that I look for uh, specifically to the internet industry and the consumer web industry uh, that really defines uh, star talent. And this has been an evolving framework. I originally identified uh, three skills and then added two more and eventually ended up with these five tools uh, and for those baseball fans out there, the, the ultimate player is a five-tool player. Uh, they hit for average, hit for power, they run, throw, and field. So I thought there was a, a nice metaphor there. So the, the five tools of the superstar uh, start with technology vision. Uh, the second is product sensibility. The third is business acumen. Uh, the fourth is leadership. And the fifth is resourcefulness. So just to double click on each very briefly, uh, in a world that's increasingly driven by technology, all of our companies, regardless of whether or not you define your company as a technology company or in the technology industry, in a world that's increasingly defined and influenced by technology, we all need people on our team that can understand where the world is going, where new technologies will take us, and their potential to influence society. And you look at some of the folks that have created the most value, and they're technology visionaries. Bill Gates recognized in Moore's Law the eventual impact of what it would mean for the cost of computing power and had a vision to put a computer on every desktop. Elon Musk recognized that the price of sustainable power, specifically electric power, would ultimately come down far enough that everyone would be able to drive an electric-powered vehicle. And of course, we've all seen what he's been able to do with Tesla. So technology vision is absolutely essential in this day and age. But technology vision is not enough. Technology vision, if left alone, is not necessarily going to create value. It'll make for a good uh, keynote speech. It may make for uh, a patent. Uh, but you actually need to understand what unmet needs exist among a customer base, and then leverage the technology to meet those unmet needs. And Dan began his presentation earlier citing a quote from Steve Jobs, who is really the quintessential example of someone who understood uh, where consumers wanted better, where we could do a better job of meeting those unmet needs, and how to leverage advances in technology to make possible what was previously never possible before. So that's product sensibility. 
However, great technology vision and strong product sensibility, still not enough. Because if you don't have a sustainable business model, it's not going to go anywhere. And we saw that in the late 90s. There were some wonderful companies with really interesting examples uh, of products that could be truly transformational, but they were losing a dollar on every unit sold and believed they'd make it up on volume, which is not a great business model. We all know how a lot of, we all know how some of those movies ended. So you need people on your team who have business acumen, who understand uh, how business models can generate value, not just in the immediate term, but longer term, how you can create uh, economic scale, how you can generate increasing returns in sustainable, truly sustainable businesses. So those were the original three skills I, I thought about. But as my career evolved, I recognized the importance of leadership. Because you can have all three of those first skills I mentioned, but if you can't evangelize them in the right way, if you can't inspire those around you to follow, you're not going to be able to do it alone. And if what you're doing is truly visionary, if it's never been done before, there's going to be a lot of skeptics out there. There's going to be a lot of people who say, forget it. There's no possible way. Even people on your own team. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter if you're two people in a garage building a new company and have to explain it to investors, or you've got a team of thousands of people at a multinational that, that runs across the world. You've got to be able to inspire people to follow you and believe in whatever vision you've articulated. So that's the leadership skill. And then lastly is resourcefulness. And frankly, uh, I would take that skill over all the others because if you have a resourceful person on your team who's just going to get it done no matter what, they'll recognize they don't have the other skills and they'll hire great people around them who do have those skills. So if you can find someone in the interview process who's superlative in any one of those areas, it's a win. If you find someone who combines more than one of those skills, you have a potential star. If you find someone that comes anywhere close to being the five-tool player, you're more likely than not not going to be able to hire them because that is Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs. Uh, but we can all try. What's more important is that you're assembling a team that possesses all of those skills in the aggregate. And I think that's absolutely essential. That's a great, great answer, Jeff. And I think we probably have time for, for just one more, one more question. And you know, we've talked about a couple of big concepts today, and I think one of the things that I appreciate that you do is make oftentimes big concepts very simple to understand. And I think something that's important to everybody, just us as workers, as human beings, is happiness. Hmm. And I would love for you to share any thoughts you could for this group about what happiness means to you and any advice you have about how we can organize our lives to enjoy it more. Yeah, so I guess I would answer it in two ways. Uh, one is sharing with you advice, some of the best advice I ever received uh, from uh, a guy I consider to be a mentor, uh, a man named Ray Chambers, an extraordinary individual. Uh, right now, he is the special emissary to the Secretary General of the United Nations, working to eradicate deaths due to malaria. And he's working now across the United Nations to help the Secretary General realize the United Nations goal across uh, the Millennium Promise Goals and improving uh, the state of healthcare uh, on a global basis. It doesn't get any more important than that. Ray came from Wall Street in the 80s. He actually created the modern day leverage buyout and, and gave it all up uh, for a life dedicated to philanthropic efforts. He was literally on top of Wall Street um, and left it all uh, a few months before the crash in 1987. And one of the reasons he left is because despite all the extraordinary success he had experienced, it wasn't making him happy. So he used the same determination and the same extraordinary intelligence and intellectual curiosity to start learning more about the concept of happiness. And he sought out some of the world's most revered figures and philosophers on the subject and essentially cobbled together uh, five rules or keys to happiness, which uh, you know, I've had the, the privilege to hear from him directly. So I would, I would share that with this group. And the first is to live in the moment which I think a lot of us understand and hear from time to time. It's difficult to practice. Uh, the second is it's better to be loving than to be right. And uh, that not only holds uh, within our organizations, it holds perhaps even more importantly at home. And, That's like uh, a chord with anyone. Any, anyone in a relationship yes. probably understands how, ch how challenging that one can be. Uh, the third is to be a spectator to your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional. And uh, that's tricky, because when you become emotional, it's really difficult to stay rational and lucid 
and understand that you bring a certain perspective to the table, the person that you're potentially talking to who's generating this emotional response from you brings their own perspectives and to remain as compassionate as you can in that moment. The fourth is to be grateful for at least one thing every day. And the fifth is to help others every chance you get. So I, I try to live by those five keys every day. It's challenging. Uh, so that's one piece of advice. I guess the, the, the second thing, Mike, and we can close on this, is that uh, I've given a lot of thought to what makes me happy. And it took me about 40 years to finally reach the conclusion that what makes me happy is looking forward to going to work every morning and looking forward to coming home every night and not one without the other. And it's a, a somewhat simple equation that requires a lot of thought and time and energy to really understand what drives both of those dimensions and then put yourself in a position to live it every day. And I'm incredibly fortunate that that's where I am. Jeff, I really, really appreciate you sharing. Thank you so much for making the time for us. And ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Wiener. Thanks. It's really fun to work for him. It's really fun. So, great morning. A fantastic amount of information shared, and I hope you have better insight into us, where we're headed, how we appreciate so much of what you do, and how we are so focused on doing everything we can to make you successful. We're going to take a break now. For those of you who are here in the room, we'll have refreshments in back. For those of you who are engaging with us while we're streaming, we'll be back here at about 10.45 Pacific or so, and looking forward to welcoming Chris Hoyt up on stage from PepsiCo to talk to us a little bit about talent branding. Thank you so much.